Hey, I want to say thank you so much for joining us for this impactful service today. Listen, I'm so excited about bringing our finale message on Jesus is King. But before I do that, I want to give a big shout out to our production team. Come on, can you just show them some love? All of our camera people, our switchers, our, our people that are working our lower thirds, and all of those that are part of our audio and, and video. Uh, you have done a fantastic job through this season that we have been going through. And uh, I'm so excited on Mother's Day, May the 10th, we're going to be reopening our services at 9 and 11. And we need help in our production team as, as our ministry has expanded. We're looking for some, some, a few good men and women that would be able to help us and serve in that area. Literally throughout this lens, we're reaching the world. Last week, we had reports from China. And we're excited about that the gospel is being preached around the world. And so thank you, Jesus, for all that he is doing. I want you to go to the gospel of Mark. As I finish this series, I am so elated over the fact that Jesus is king. I started about five weeks ago on Jesus is king over the storm and talked about how Jesus is king over disappointment and Jesus is king over the after and Jesus is king over uh, every situation and scarcity. This morning, evening, afternoon, whichever time you're watching, I'm going to be teaching that Jesus is king over the critics. And I want you to join me in the gospel of Mark chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, A few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home, and they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. You can see how impactful Jesus' ministry was in the very beginning. And he preached the word to them. And some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging, digging through it and then lowered the mat and the man that was lying on it. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, I want you to get this, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can for forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking and in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up take up your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Now, I want you to know in this moment, Jesus is king over the critics. I want you to join me bowing your head and praying for those that are watching and those that are listening into the word of God. Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you would give me clarity of thought, ease of expression. Lord, I pray that the words that I speak would be fashioned for the audience that is preparing to receive. And I pray, God, as we end this series, Lord, that this message would speak to every follower of Jesus. Lord, I thank you today for what you're going to do. And for every person that doesn't know you as their personal Savior and Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would draw them in by your grace and mercy. And I give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen, amen, and amen. Well, come on now, turn to your neighbor and tell them Jesus is king over the critics. I, I need you to see this text 
in its totality. And I literally am going to walk you through the whole chapter of the gospel of Mark chapter 2. I want you to see that before we begin the text, I, I really want to introduce this idea of how God designed us. He formed and fashioned us for his purpose, and he has a plan for our lives. It's so interesting that as God creates us that many of us have different shapes and sizes. I remember as a kid uh, growing up, I had to match the shapes, the, the circle, the oval, the rectangle, the square. Becoming a parent, you bought certain toys that would help identify the shapes for your kids. And no matter what shape you had and no matter what peg they had, they would always try with great effort to fit the round peg in the square hole. Never fails. That they would try to force fit a shape that didn't match the whole. And many of us are shaped in different sizes, but if you're not careful, you'll allow people to frame your size. They will square you off. They will begin to frame you into who they think you should be. And if you're going to become a follower of Jesus, if you're going to do anything significant, if you're going to live the life that God designed you to live, you're going to have to get comfortable with criticism. You're going to have to be comfortable with people who have squared you off and have labeled you a certain way or a certain size or a certain manner because if you're not careful, you'll start living up to their label. <clears throat> if you're not careful, you'll begin to Square yourself off based upon what other people think you are. And I think it's important today that you begin to live the purpose-driven life that God designed you to live. God doesn't want you to live up to everybody's label of you. He wants you to live up to the label he has called you to become. And in this text, we see uh, Jesus is in the house. And when Jesus is in the house and he's teaching and preaching... And demonstrating something is going to happen. Something good is going to happen. And we see how Jesus handles the critics. The critics are always in the crowd. Mm -hmm. If I was preaching in this sanctuary, uh, even though it would be full of people, not everybody that is in the room is for you and believes everything you're going to say. There are people that are around you that are there, not because of you, but in spite of you. And Jesus recognized that you're always going to attract critics if you're going to live the purpose-driven life. And, and so when these men came up and they began to see that the crowd was large, they had decided that they were going to do something uncommon. They were going to climb up the roof. They were going to dig a hole and this man's house and literally drop their friend down on the mat. And you can imagine as they were doing that, that there became a great ruckus. There became a great f flurry of commotion as uh, Jesus was teaching and, and literally things were beginning to fall out of the roof. I mean, I could not imagine. There's already distractions you deal with as a communicator, but now Jesus is dealing with literally pieces of the roof falling down, and as they are falling down and falling out, there are some men hanging over their heads, looking down, and they are bringing a man down off through the roof, and Jesus does something that is intentional. Uh, don't think that anything that Jesus does is accidental. No, no, no. Jesus does things intentional, and, and what he does is he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, I need you to understand something. Jesus, even though he declared that that is not necessarily what the man was looking for. He was not necessarily looking for his sins to be forgiven, nor was his friends looking for his sins to be forgiven. 
But Jesus will offend your mind to reveal your heart. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says something so blatant and so disruptive that the Bible says that the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law, said to themselves. Now, I, I want you to see the, the stages of criticism and how to manage the criticism that you're going to endure if you're going to live the purpose-driven life. You see, Jesus offends their mind to reveal their heart. And they said to themselves, how only God can forgive. How can this man forgive forgive sins. And see, Jesus does that on purpose. Jesus does that because he wants us to understand that, that, that he is in the business of transformation and he will many times offend us because of our religious pretenses that we have developed over our life. Jesus will rub us the wrong way because he's trying to rub the wrong in us, out of us. Can I can I get a witness? Sometimes Jesus will do some things that will offend our mind to reveal our heart, our ambitions, our desires, and, and our, our own ways and, and proclivities that we think God should do this in this certain way. If you are going to walk with Jesus, you're going to have to learn not to get so ad uh, adopted into the how uh, more than the why. You're going to have to recognize this. It doesn't matter how how God does certain things or when God does certain things or even who God uses to do certain things that you're going to just have to follow the man Jesus and know the why behind the what because Jesus many times will offend our minds to reveal our hearts and 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 you're going to deal with the silent criticism I'm talking about the silent criticism on the inside of even a follower of Jesus that sometimes God does some things that we don't understand we think it's for our our uh, our or destroy uh, to destroy us or or uh, or to delay us but maybe it was there to develop us and all of the pretenses God is working out of us that I call it the inner Pharisee inside of all of us that we deal with sometimes because Jesus is trying to work through our motives and ambitions so that we can follow him and fulfill the destiny that he has for our lives and and it's just like y'all remember that back in the day I, I I know I'm a little bit older I know I'm I'm not as current as some of the other people, but I, I, there was a, a great movie called Karate Kid. It was so good that they made a they made a, a remake of it, and and I remember what what uh, the story goes if you know the old school the original karate kid you know how mr miyagi and daniel son gathered together and and daniel son all he wanted to have was a uh, the ability to fight for himself and defend himself and he goes to mr miyagi and he says i i want to learn karate and and uh, every time that he goes to see uh mr miyagi mr miyagi said come on come on let's paint the fence and he leave the can and he and, and he'd paint the fence and he'd paint the whole fence the whole day be tired be worn out and next time he come he'd say come on we're gonna paint the house and he'd paint the house side to side come on now side to side and he he'd he'd tell him no 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 side to side and he'd paint the paint the paint the house and he'd work the house and then the next day he'd come in and he'd tell him to sand the floor no 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 sand the floor <laughs> come on sand the floor and, 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 and Daniel's son was getting frustrated because he came, uh, he came to learn karate. But, but, but in the process of him going through this, this season, this time, every time he went to Mr. Miyagi's house, Mr. Miyagi would give him some type of job to do. And he almost felt like he was being a slave uh, for uh, Mr. Miyagi. And finally, you know, the final, one of the final days he told him, come on, I'll need you to wax the cars. Come on, wax on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And wax off. I mean, until finally he was so frustrated because he felt like Mr. Miyagi had cheated him all this time, all this effort, didn't know that his delay was actually his development, that all of this labor, all of this work, and God in his, in his providence will sometimes allow us to go through certain things and allow some things to happen in our lives. And if you're not careful, God will offend your mind to reveal your heart. And it's so important today because 
Many times we become silent critics. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand how it's going to happen. I don't understand how this is going to become, become a reality. But I need you to know today that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. If you are a follower of Jesus, you got to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. You got to be comfortable with the detours and the changes and the misdirections that God is going to send you. And there's going to be seasons of your life that people are going to leave you. They're going to they're going to critique you. And in those silent seasons of your life, they're going to depart your life. And you're going to think that you have lost uh, and you have failed uh, or you've been set back. And they think that their departure is your demise. Uh, but you need to know something today that their departure was your deliverance uh, because it taught you how to trust God. It tra- taught you how to change. It taught you how to lean on the everlasting arm of God. Listen, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to deal with the silent critic on the inside and the silent critic on the outside. Jesus is developing a purpose-driven life, and he is to showing us in this moment how to manage the criticism. And when Jesus, well, after he offended all of the hearts of men, he said that you may know mm, that I have the power to forgive sins. He said, what is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins and the, the authority to heal. He said, pick up your mat and walk. And Jesus demonstrated and the one of his demonstration silence the critics but I need you to know something the critics were only silent for a moment they're only silent for a moment and we see how as Jesus navigates through this text we see that there is going to be some more criticism that's going to come towards Jesus and his disciples now the Bible tells us that all of a sudden when he shows up uh, and he begins to uh, fellowship in Mark chapter 2. We see him begin to fellowship in verse th- verse 13. The Bible says, once again, Jesus went all, out beside the lake, and a large crowd again gathered around him, and, and he saw Levi, Levi, um, son of Alphaeus, sitting out at the tax collector. This was, this was a tax collector. Uh, Jesus was uh, seeing him, and he said, Levi, follow me. And the man got up and followed him. And then Jesus, after having dinner uh, with Levi, said, many tax collector sinners were eating with him and his disciples. And, and the Bible says, I want you to see this in verse 16. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, I need you to see they move from silent critics uh, to what I call sideway critics. Mm-hmm. Because they move from the thought of criticism. And you got to be careful about the thoughts of criticism. You got to be careful to begin to navigate those thoughts and be able to filter those thoughts. But it, when that thought begins to get into your heart, like the, the Pharisees, they started going sideways on their criticism. And they, they didn't go to Jesus. They went to his disciples and they said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And, and I need you to see this. Critics seldomly seek understanding. They they always most likely look to undermine. They are asking a question to the disciples because the disciples are this newly formed group and they want to undermine uh, their loyalty to Jesus. They are working. They, you know, you know, critics come not to confront. They always come to circle. Come on, somebody. And, and they're upset because Jesus is now moving the apple cart. He is rocking the boat. He is uh, stirring up uh, their own religious uh, ideology. Jesus is uh, messing with their own theology. Jesus is messing with because now Jesus has moved from demonstrating his power to heal, but now he's now picking out people that don't look like him and, and do like him and, and, and think like him. He's pulling out a tax collector and, and he's calling a tax collector and he, he's now eating with sinners and they are upset with the, with the decorum that Jesus is uh, provoking on the disciples and they go to them and 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 I need you to see that 
that in this text, Jesus is turning up the status quo because they have, he is changing the way we see humanity because most of us in life, we look at the people that are qualified. We look at the pedigree. We look at the ability. But, but with God, he, he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I, I need you to see this in the text, that, that in this offense of how God can use somebody. You know how God can use anything and anybody how God doesn't allow your past to disqualify you yeah you may have a rap sheet but I want to say thank you Jesus that all of us have a resume of our past that we're not proud of but maybe your past is not disqualifying you but maybe your past is preparing you for the move that God's about to make in your life you see today God is the God is the one who appoints he's the one who purposes and he's the one that delivers and he's the one that can change and he's the one that can pick and he doesn't ask for a committee he doesn't ask for a group of men he doesn't ask for people's opinion when God picks people out uh, he picks them out on his own volition uh, for his own purpose and and it's upsetting uh, these Pharisees and they go to his associates and they start talking about Jesus uh, and they're whispering in their ear why why is he doing that now I need you to see something you you know you've started some change when uh, people start going to your associates and start talking about you. You you need to take it as a compliment uh, uh, because they're trying to use them to get to you. Uh, they're trying to allow that criticism uh, to deflate uh, your purpose and delay your destiny. But I need you to see this, that, that, that your real associates, the people that really know you, the people that, that are really going to hang with you, those are the people that know you the best and love you the most. And, and they're trying to upset the associates. They're trying to upset the disciples. It's ragged tag group of men that really don't understand everything that Jesus is doing really don't understand why he's sitting with tax collectors and why he's hanging out with sinners and and but they see uh, that there's a wonder in his eye they they see the love and the grace that is flowing out of his uh, out of his essence they they see that he's doing something and they really don't know how to handle the the attack uh, from the criticism and Jesus answered uh, the criticism he said listen I hear you whispering uh, and behind the closed doors. I, I see you talking in the hallways. I, I hear your rumors uh, that you're saying about me. And I need you to know something. I didn't come for those that are well. Jesus very clearly communicated. I didn't come uh, for those that are healthy. I came for the sick. Jesus wanted them to understand that uh, that his purpose uh, was not going to be delayed. And, and I need you to know something. If you're going to shake off criticism, if you're going to, if you're going to be able to handle the criticism uh, and, and become the person that God designed you to be, if you're going to be able to, to withstand uh, the fiery attacks of, of people's opinion, uh, you're going to have to have a strong why. You're going to have to understand something that the reason why you are doing what you're doing uh, and why you are living and why you're in Houston and why you're at Sugarland and why you're in Stafford and why. See, there are two significant dates uh, upon your life. Uh, the day you were born uh, and the day you discover why you were born. Uh, see, I need you to see something in this in this text. Jesus had a strong why. He said, I didn't come uh, to create a country club. Uh, I didn't come uh, to appease people's opinions. I, I didn't come to be popular. I came to become purposeful. And I put popularity on the side. I came with a mission. I, I came with an agenda. I came to seek and save that which was lost. I feel this for somebody. You need to know your mission. You need to know your purpose. When you go into this battle, when you go into your destiny, when you make decisions, you're not making decisions based on the popularity of what you're going to do. You're doing it because you believe in what you're called to do and believe in who you're called to be. You got to be steadfast unmovable, always abounding. You got to be able to be anchored in a purpose that's bigger than you. I didn't come to Houston just to come to Houston. I came to be a world changer. I came to be a destiny maker. I came to leave a legacy. I came with a purpose and by hell or high water through hurricanes and pandemics and hell and backbiting and gossiping, I'm going to fulfill what God called me to do. I'm going to make a 
like a city on a hill, a bright born morning star. I'm going to do the purpose that God has called me to do. And you need to be resolved. You got to build a big why. You got to shake off criticism. You got to shake off the haters. You got to shake off the opinions. And you got to know why you are doing what you are doing. And I want you to know, once you get that why, and once you get that mindset, you won't care what they say. You won't care what they do. Because your mind is made up. Mm. My God. There's always going to be some sideway criticism. You haven't changed anything until you've made some people upset. Jesus is turning up the change. Turning up the tables. He's making an impact that they cannot control. Mm -hmm. Because the whole purpose of criticism is to is to cause you to be double-minded. It's causing you to be second-guessing your decisions, to question your motive and agenda. And you see this in the text. Uh, the criticism has gone from silence to silence. They didn't come to Jesus. Now they have come to his disciples. And Jesus, with his clarity has communicated that I know why I'm here. And I have come for a purpose. And the Bible tells us that as he continued on, now look what they did. The Bible says that after they had silent criticism and sideway criticism, they started moving with what I call surrogate criticism. They sent some people. And look what they're discussing. Mm. The Bible says that now Jesus' disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. It's verse 18, and they said some people came and asked Jesus. This is in the same chapter. You see, the chapter continues to evolve as the criticism grows. <laughs> And Jesus is now dealing with some people came to Jesus. So it's the it's the some people. And and I used to ask the question, who are these people? But now I don't even ask who these people are. Mm -hmm. And they come and they ask the question. They said, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but why aren't you? We are fasting. Oh, why? We are, are, are doing uh, the fasting, and we are covering our heads, and we are fasting through the week. And we are, they, yeah, you notice they always will compare what they are doing and what you are not doing. Mm -hmm. They, I, I call it petty criticism. They're going to, they're never going, listen, can I give you a word about people that have the spirit of criticism? There's a difference between criticism and correction. Criticism doesn't always points at what you are not doing. Correction doesn't just point at what you didn't do, but points to you to a better way of doing it. These are people that are not trying to make you better. They're trying to make you bitter. Mm, I, I just need to have a sideway conversation. They have come with their petty uh, nitpicking point of view. They, they're going to fuss at you and they're going to point out what you're not doing and they are never going to celebrate. Can I tell you something? They are never going to celebrate. If you are waiting for them to throw a parade about what you are doing, you're going to wait for the rest of your life. Can I get a witness? Can I tell you today, you are not there to try to appease your critics. You are there to remove the obstacles that are in in front of you and they are facing this reality and they're saying why isn't Jesus why isn't why aren't you fasting why aren't you doing what we are doing I don't understand why don't you stand like we stand why don't you do this why isn't there a cross on your building why why are you have a light why is the wall black they're always going to find something that, that, that they do not like and they're going to major on the minor they ain't going to see all the people that get saved they're going to talk about how loud the music 
music is. Can, they're going, I, I'm going to get to meddle in just a minute. Because I've been around church long enough that, that people that, uh, that are, are focused on the minor will always major on it. And you got to learn how not to major on the minor, but you got to learn how to major on the major and minor on the minor and keep the main thing, the main thing. And Jesus gave a clarity of thought. He said, listen. I'm going to give you a parable. I want you to understand something. He said, he said, new wine can't be held in old wineskins. I need you to see this. I need you to discover this. Nor can a garment have a new patch put on an old piece of garment. He said, because it'll be threaded apart. That new wine that is poured into an old wineskin, when it gets poured down into that old wineskin, that wineskin is going to burst because the new wine the potency of that wine cannot hold cannot be held in that old dilapidated wineskin and Jesus said I didn't come to put a patch on your life I came to make you new today it's not what you have done it's what I am going to do I'm not trying to make a patch on your life to try to make you better I'm going to make you better by making you new today day. I'm going to give you a new fresh oil. I'm going to give you new joy. I'm going to give you new mercy. I'm going to give you a new path. I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to give you new ears. I'm going to give you a new understanding. God is in to the new and he wants you to understand that old doors don't lead to new paths. Not nor do old methods lead to new innovation. He said, I didn't come to make a tweak. I came to bring a transformation. And that transformation is a newness of life today and I've come to bring the new and that's exactly what God wants to do in your life he wants to renew you day by day hour by hour minute by minute every day is a new opportunity a new day of blessing a new day of purpose I need you to see you can either live in the old or you can live in the new. Uh, you can either live in the old ways uh, or you can live in a new way. Uh, and it's not a new way of works. Uh, it's a new way of grace and truth. And Jesus is declaring him. And the problem is is that the critics are armed with the tradition and the history of what was. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have sent some people some surrogates, and they are armed with the status quo. Why do we need to change? Why do we need to do something? Why do we need to do this? Because Jesus is all about the new. He wants to bring fresh bread. Mm -hmm. He wants to bring a fresh purpose. He wants to bring fresh power. He wants to bring fresh oil. He wants to bring fresh wine. He doesn't want you to have yesterday's blessing. I, I thank God for what he did yesterday, but I can't live in yesterday. I got to live in the new and in the new is part of the now and I gotta see myself in what God is making new and I can't be glorifying what was I gotta begin to focus on what will be and what will be is focusing on the new God doesn't want you to get stuck with comfortable God doesn't want you to get stuck in yesteryears God doesn't want you to get stuck in the old ways God wants you to know there's a new way there's a new joy there's a new and God wants you to focus on the new Mm. Oh, I thank God for, the, for what he did, but I'm looking for what he's going to do. And that's what Jesus was trying to get them to focus on. And, 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 and if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you can't glorify your past and move into your destiny. You're going to have to honor your past and be focused on what God has in front of your life. Thank God for what he did back then. People, I can hear people of saints, oh, I remember back when, when we had those sawdust revivals and we had those big tents and we had all that. But can I tell you something? There were critics 
with the big tents and the sawdust. You can talk about A.A. A. Allen and, and the healing revivals in the 50s. But what A.A. A. Allen did was criticize. There was people on religious circles. They were always pointing their finger because A.A. A. Allen did something that nobody else was doing. In A.A. A. Allen's tents, there were black men and white men worshiping God under the same place. And in that time, in the 1950s, segregation reigned. And I can tell you, he was being criticized. He was being mocked. He was being scolded. He was being laughed at. But now we're glorified because the innovators, innovators of today are the history makers of tomorrow. Can I tell you today, that's exactly what God wants you to see. Thank God for those people who laid a pioneer so that today that we can see people of all nationalities in this church begin to worship God. And we can begin to see the whole host of heaven being formed right before us. But can I tell you, there's some new things that God wants to do in and through your life. And the only way for you to move into the new is you got to let go of the old, old ways, old doors, old paths. And Jesus is dealing with his critics who have finally sent some people his way. I'm trying to tell you, if you're going to be a purpose-driven follower of Jesus, you're going to have to learn how to deal with the offense of your mind. You're going to have to deal with the purpose on your life, and you're going to have to deal with continually progressing and walking out the newness that he has for your life. And then finally they got to the point where they had, they had enough with Jesus. They finally got to the point where they had said, we are tired of this. And the Bible says in verse 23 they, that Jesus had done, messed up the apple cart. Mm. He had done, turned the tables on them. The Bible tells us that on the Sabbath day, Jesus was walking through the grain fields. And they were picking some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Mm. They had finally got to the place where they confronted Jesus. They said, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They finally got to the courage where they spoke up. Because Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus, he's going to break the mold. He's going to break the pretenses. You're going to have to endure some criticism. And there's going to be some silent criticism. There's going to be some sideway criticism. And there's going to be some surrogate criticism. And then there's going to be some outspoken criticism. And the criticism that they had, because, you know, you know religion, what it is built on is control and complexity. It's built on complexity, control. It carries the burden. And Jesus was throwing off the complexity with the simplicity. Jesus was not throwing the burden on you. He was throwing the burden off of you. And Jesus was just tired of it. Jesus was just tired because he, I need you to see something. I need you to see that huh, Jesus is the king of truth. He come to make you free. And there's truth in the gospel that is so simple that he has come to make you free. He that the Son has made free is free and free. But I can tell you something. Truth will make you free, but grace will keep you free. Did you hear what I just said? I said truth will make you free, but grace will keep you free. And Jesus said, Sabbath wasn't, it's not some religious rules complexity I said no 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 man wasn't made for the sabbath the sabbath was made for the man and he said i'm the lord of the sabbath i've come to set him free i've come to remove the burden of religion you know religion spells Life towards God is D-O. Christianity spells religion as D-O-N-E, done, done. Jesus said, I'm throwing off the complexity. I'm throwing off the control. I'm giving you freedom today. I'm giving you simplicity today. 
I'm king over the criticism. And I'm king over the Sabbath. I need you to see that. I need you to see that he's king. I'm not bound by your legalism. I'm not bound by your opinions. I'm not going to be horse collared by your rules. I know who I am. And I know why I'm here. I'm king over the critics. Say what you want. Do what you want. But at the end of the day, when the dust is settled, I know where my destiny lies. I know who's going to lead me. And I know who's going to deny me. I know who's going to doubt me. And I know who's going to scatter. And in the fabric of my faith, the fabric of my disciples, I'm not going to be moved. Today, I need you to hear me. In the fabric of your faith, in the framework of the community of God, that God is going to allow people to come a part of your life. And be a part of your life. There are people that are going to be coming and going. Some people will be with you for a season. And some people will be with you for a lifetime. Your eye is not on the barometer of what people think. If you live for the praises of men, you'll die by their criticism. Today, everyone who's watching, God has placed a purpose on your life. And that purpose is collective to the purposes of God all across this city. God has divine interconnections, hubs, and people that are going to move you from place to place and from glory to glory. But I need you to know something. Jesus modeled to us how to live with criticism. Today, you may be de dealing with some criticism. There are some changes that are happening in your life. Oh, if people don't mind you changing the way you talk. They just don't want you to change the way you walk. They don't mind you looking good on the outside, but they don't want you to change on the inside. But the moment that you start moving in a direction that indicts their complacency, you become a threat because your purpose becomes greater than their poor circle. And today God is calling some people to come out. Come on. To move forward. To step into the purpose and the destiny that God has. And to discover the why behind the what.